Uh, hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Andrea Morales, or Andy. That's how people know me here. And today I'm going to talk to you guys about IOAS, my thesis, uh, which is basically about the design of playful community-led monetary infrastructures. Uh, so IOAS is a community-led monetary infrastructure uh, for local currencies that uses play as a way of visualizing and making actionable local economies. Uh, it was developed with the case scenario of the Berkshires in mind, which is the largest local currency in the United States. Um, I owe you, I owe us, I'm sorry, response to the social context of uh, what happened after the financial crisis of 2008. So eight years later, um, there has been a lot of talk and a lot of analysis about what happened back then, who was to be blamed for what happened. Um, and you know, fingers were pointed and some people said that it was the fault of big banks and of the centralization of these monetary infrastructures. Um, apparently there were a lot of greedy bankers that were at the center of this whole thing and we couldn't trust them anymore. So people like Silicon Valley started saying that what we should be looking at is the creation of a decentralized, trustless system of technology. Um, and that would most certainly eliminate all these problems. Um, but was that really so? Was it all to be solved by trustless technology? Um, instead of prescribing what I thought, I set out to map the different monetary infrastructural systems that exist right now uh, to compare them and understand where these people were coming from. Uh, the first one is cash. Uh, so if we look at cash, uh, in the case of the US, of course, um, it is expedited by the Federal Reserve. And many people at Silicon Valley allege that that is a problem because it is quite centralized and it can lead to a lot of uh, issues in the economy. It does, however, offer the flexibility for people to do whatever they want with it once they have it. They can even burn piles of cash if they want. Um, then we have credit. Uh, the interesting thing about credit is that it is deeply tied to big banks. Um, so it is kind of seen as, you know, the the bad one in here, uh, because credit is something that can only be given by banks. Um, but it is very convenient, which is the reason that people use it a lot. Um, it is completely led by computational networks, which is also leading to the so-called cashless society. Um, and in opposition to those two, we have what is the representation of you know, many solutions that were being developed by Silicon Valley, but specifically I'm going to be talking about Bitcoin. Um, and so people get really excited about Bitcoin uh, because it uh, represents a decentralized source of cash where anyone that has a computer or the right computational power can create money. And that money can then be spent by anyone. Uh, but the interesting thing is that at the end of the day, it has to do with eliminating trust from the system. It's eliminating the human error. Um, and so I started looking at this and I wonder, is there a way, is there, is there an opportunity space that isn't being shown? Is there perhaps something not so inherently wrong with trusting other human beings when you're talking about money? Um, so with that in mind, I set out to find a community to explore one simple question. Uh, how might communities uh, lead their own decentralized monetary infrastructure? But of course, that is very uh, big, so I needed a specific context. And I found the Berkshires, dubbed the Hamptons of Brooklyn. The Berkshires are a series of small towns in the west of Massachusetts. Uh, they are actually super dependent on New York City. Um, their economy is a cyclical one where they depend on the tourism that comes from New York every summer. Um, but they also, interestingly enough, have a lot of initiatives in new economics, meaning they uh, have invested in co-ops and land trusts and farmer markets and a, a lot of different economic interventions. And one of them, which is the most interesting to me, of course, because I'm talking about money, um, is the Berkshires. The Berkshires is a local experiment in cash. It's a local currency uh, that started in 2006 as a way of keeping money in the economy. Uh, but looking back at the opportunity space, what was also interesting in the case of the Berkshires, as I studied them further, was that they seem like a small scale version of the dollar. Uh, they work almost exactly the same. Uh, and they are emitted by a central sort, uh, source of sorts, which is actually my partners, the Schumacher Center for New Economics. Um, so in this small or smaller lab, um, for my question, I started uh, thinking, how might the Berkshires, the community, lead their own decentralized Berkshire, the money, infrastructure? 
Uh, but now that I more or less had a sandbox for action, you know, a space that I really wanted to intervene in, um, I started thinking critically about what design could contribute back to this space. Um, and so I started going into user-centric design. Um, and the interesting part about user-centric design is that, of course, we all know it here, it's become more and more prevalent in recent years. Um, and it has led to a lot of very good innovations. But as Cameron Tonkin was uh, director of uh, the PhD over at, at Carnegie Mellon once said, the problem with uh, user-centered design is that it is really hard for it to look at big systemic problems. And the reason is pretty simple. He points that uh, the cornerstone of this kind of design is empathy. And empathy, as we're defining it right now, only deals with a really limited version of the we. I empathize with you almost in a very egotistical way. I empathize with you because I can relate back to something that happened to me. And in that way, the we just becomes about you and I. Um, so I wonder what sort of design could decenter itself, specifically if we're talking about issues as big as money and noticing that it is actually affecting many, many people around the world. Um, According to Brian Upton, which is the author of a book I really like called The Aesthetic of Play, um, play is precisely the definition of something that is not at all user-centered uh, because it is an end unto itself and it is the exploration of systems. Uh, something that people do because they see inherent value in it. There is no other reason to go into a play space. Um, so that led me to a question, and, and of course many here know that you know, I'm a big advocate of play. So that led me to a question, how could play specifically enable a decentralized community-led Berkshire's infrastructure? And from this point of view, I'm coming at it from the point of view of the design of play, or what many people think is the design of games. Uh, it is important to define play before I go on, not as something necessarily that's fun, which is what everyone thinks, you know, play is fun, no, we're all having fun but rather as a free movement in a system of constraints. And I'll give you an example of what that sort of play looks like. If you look at role playing, you are playing. You don't have uh, an idea of who's winning necessarily. And you might even role play something sad or something sexy or something uh, depressing. There are many different sorts of play in role play. So that's more the sort of play that I'm interested in, which is when you create a sandbox of constraints in which people can then act in ways that they see consequence. Um, but since people come to play out of their own will, out of their own agenda, it is hard to see the long-term effects that play has on the world. And this is one of the main critiques that is done, for example, uh, of gamification. Right? It's a game enough to change anything in the world when, to begin with, you're going into the game because you just want to play. Right? Um, so there's kind of like this duality where games seem to be apart from reality. They have their own magic circle that people enter in certain ways. Um, but I wondered still, if play was the way that I could decenter this and look at systems, then perhaps the way of starting about this is to just create an experiment. So I'm gonna create a game. I'm gonna create a game that's gonna think about uh, these monetary problems, big systems, and see if people can start reflecting upon them, creating a sympathy and understanding of the system through a game that might later on relate to reality, but I wasn't sure quite how yet. Uh, so the first thing I did was actually a game. It is called The Seeing Game. Um, and it was a game in which I explored uh, the system of credit card debt, since it was the system that most people are in touch with and that is currently uh, the most prominent when Bitcoin people talk about the future of cashless of Bitcoin versus credit. Um, and players would represent two sites, banks and debtors, and then reflect upon after they played and felt the anxiety of the game and the anxiety of owing a bank, um, although in a more abstract way. Uh, they would then have a dialogue with me and with each other about what they felt could be improved in this system, in this game. It was basically an abstraction. I was doing research. I wanted to see what gaps they saw in this system. Um, and the interesting thing was that uh, they told me that one of the big issues that they had was that visibility in a system where you owe a bank something and, the, and you can't see what the bank is gonna do was actually the main issue, 
right? And especially when they were exchanging with each other, they didn't quite know how money was flowing. They didn't quite know what money meant or exchanges meant at all. So they told me that what excited them about the game was that they felt like they were in control and had some sort of visibility of what was happening. Um, so in that way, I, I started looking at it more as in, you know, visibility is the first way of bridging the space between the magic reality of a game and the reality of our world as we know it. Uh, this was a hypothesis, right? I, I wasn't quite sure, but I had a hunch. Um, so when I actually visited the Berkshires, I wanted to find out if that was the case. I wanted to find out if visibility was a big issue in this grander game of money that I was starting to create in my head. Um, to my surprise, when I went to the Berkshires, uh, the locals knew how the Berkshires worked, um, and they knew it completely. They could explain the system to me. Yeah, you go to the bank, you get Berkshires, and then you can pay for anything. Um, and when I asked them why they used them, they said, well, of course, it gives back to the community. Uh, but when I started poking and asking, how does it give back to the community, they didn't quite know how to respond to that. Um, and to make matters even worse, or more interesting, um, they couldn't pinpoint the difference between dollars and Berkshires. To them, they were basically the same thing. So they had no inherent uh, reason to be a part of the Berkshire system because, yeah, it's good for the community. How often do you use it? Oh, almost never. It's the same thing as dollars. Um, so going back to the strength of games as paths of visibility into systems, I decided to first tackle uh, this, how can I create that union, by creating a visualization of how the Berkshires worked that would also differentiate the Berkshires from dollars in the hopes of leading to play, to play in the system of money of the Berkshires. Um, so my first prototype was that I created the Berkshire till, which is a cash register unique to the Berkshires that would sit side by side with the dollar registers, but oppose it be dif different from what we know in dollars. By being transparent, uh, by being filled with light that would light up as payments happen, emitting randomized sounds when those exchanges happen to, and sending information to an app tracking system where you could see how payments were happening in real time in the community. You know, I was thinking, of course, that visualization might lead to play. It might be an interesting way of going about this. Um, but my design came up short. Uh, when I tested it with the center, the Schumacher Center, and with local farmers, they all seemed very excited about visualizing the system of the Berkshires, but they still could not see what to do with it afterwards. Um, in other words, they created a play space, but no constraints. So I pivoted, uh, and I thought that perhaps what I could do is insert the game into their reality. In order to do that, I created these tiny payment methods that were almost functioning as a credit card, uh, but they would still involve this idea of lights and sound and visualizing the system, except in this case, they would have rules, rules for budgeting, rules for exchanging with other people. Um, and they, they were quite interesting. People were really excited about them because they felt like they were making a change into what existed. Uh, but they said something that was really interesting and that led to where I am currently which is that they talked about a lack of connection to a bigger way of looking at the system. So the first thing that I actually wanted games to do, which was people to think about systems, they stopped doing it. Uh, it was as if there was something else needed to see the full system, something that I didn't quite know what it would be. Um, and while talking to them, they explained to me, yeah, what I really need is a space for not only being able to see change in money in my real life, but also to be able to change it in a bigger sense. Uh, so to go from one to the other through visibility. With that in mind, I created IOS, which is the system that I mentioned in the, in the beginning. Um, IOS uh, has three main parts that all respond to the different parts of what I talked about games so far, which is a token, which is the game inside your reality, a beacon, which is the way of visualizing how the bigger system works, and a communal activation session, uh, which is where we play the game that allows us to change the bigger system. So the token itself functions in many ways like the pyramids. Uh, the main difference is that the token now allows you to see in real time how your exchanges are affecting not only others, but yourself um, through lights. Then you have the beacon, 
which was quite the evolution from the cash register and became more of a signaling, uh, um, a signaling machine of sorts uh, that would, through light and sound, allow you to connect to others, and also you could pay with your beacon on it, which meant that you could eventually give back uh, to the community uh, by individually connecting to the beacons. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, and so you can see the beacon working there. And finally, communal activation, which are sessions where people uh, can come together every time the tokens deactivate on purpose so that people have to, every month and every six months, get together to talk about how the system is working or not through a game. And I think going forward, what was interesting was that this definitely tackled a space between play and, um, and I'm sorry, between play and infrastructures. Uh, there have been other games that I looked at, like Make em Money, uh, which work with a local currency to have people use it more. And what they said was they needed to reinforce infrastructure. One game wasn't enough. Uh, so going forward, what I want to do is to explore the space of the game where you can visualize the system even more, because I believe that that's where I'm going to be able to actually create a system that changes how we look at money. Um, so have these three towers of my infrastructure work together in a space of play instead of a space of a solitary game. That's it. Thank you. It, it changes the way it is used to begin with. Um, if you look at credit cards and if you look at cash, uh, on the side of cash, what you have is a lack of uh, visualization. Yes, I can't understand it. But even if I could understand it, I can't change it because the scale is too big. On the side of credit, I can understand it. I have apps like Mint, et cetera, but I can't change it either. So it's a, it's a kind of like a, a problem of two things. The first one, understanding it, and the second one, being able to act upon it. Um, games can help you understand it, but you need to also embed play in other parts of a system so that it can reflect back on the game. Because what, I, what I'm getting from this is I think really interesting um, approach, and I think that looking at games next to these different um, sort of economic systems is really a smart way to look at it because there are different sets of objectives and goals in each of those in, with cash and credit and local currencies. Um, and so part of me wants you to like have this, like almost with a deck of cards where you can play a lot of different games with, dif with the same deck of cards. Mm. If there was a way to illustrate for people how the game would play out if you were, if this were a representation of a cash economy and mm. how it would play out if it was a representation of big mm. banking and how it plays out when it's a representation of Berkshire. Right. And that then they could walk away and be like, oh, I'm going to use Berkshire. Because right. that's how it, like, it's still people win. I mean, there's mm. still businesses that make more money because they offer products and services that people value mm -hmm. more. That doesn't change. Mm -hmm. the whole, all of them have the similar objective of assigning a, a one metric to a variety of goods and services. Mm -hmm. But that the sort of way it plays out for different stakeholders is different. Right. Um, so I think, I just think that it, that would be an interesting sort of wrinkle. Right. That, that would help people understand how it, how it relates to these other options. Yeah. Oh. No, no. Uh, you knew a lot about play going into this. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could describe how working in this context, context deepened your understanding about play. Oh, yeah. Um, so one of the most interesting things for me was um, the definition of play versus game, uh, which I tr try, try to tackle here, but that's, you know, it's a lot. Um, but if, if you look at games and, and the way you can look at them theoretically, um, is that they have really strict constraints. And um, some might say that this is polemic, some won't. But uh, they tend to lead you towards a win-in state. 
it's not necessarily true, but they tend to, right? Whereas uh, play is much more about having constraints, but those constraints can change as the players negotiate them. Um, so this is why I mentioned role play, right? In role play, there doesn't have to be an ending. There doesn't have, a win have to be a winning state. Um, so what I realized through this thesis was that when I looked at games as instances that people came in and then jumped out, um, it, it didn't lead to any sort of bigger change because they didn't have a way to then enact that change. Uh, but play, play can do that if you have instances of games in your everyday life and then in this bigger you know, uh, communal sessions that are connected to each other through playful objects like the beacon, like the token, like that create the inputs for those games. Um, so I know that that might seem a, a, a bit complicated, but what I mean by that is to go into a game, you need to have the input from play. Um, so it's a bigger play uh, area, scenario. It's not gamification, right? Understanding in deeper ways the anthropology and psychology of m m m money and exchange per se. But it's really interesting for you to come at it from this technological game and play perspective, mm -hmm. which I think you're actually beginning to convince me is actually a kind of interesting way to actually go. So mm -hmm. I think actually to, to come back to the what you might call the deep, the sort of depth anthropology of money, and then to sort of begin to make the case that fourth space which you've identified, and that's a considerable achievement to actually achieve, to create out of something which is so ubiquitous across human culture, money and exchange, to find a kind of new space there is actually very good indeed. I just want to compliment you on that. Thank you. You've done something out of it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>